All righty, how you guys doing? Good to see you. We got to get started off by uh, somebody's special birthday today. It rhymes with uh, Debbie Rucker. So we're going to sing happy birthday to Debbie. Third row, right over here. Trying to hide, but it's, it's not going to happen. Uh, on the count of three, one, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Right there, Debbie. Happy birthday to you. Spell that name. Happy birthday. You didn't do it. Hey, dear Debbie. D E B B I E. Happy birthday to you. All right. Good to see you guys. Well, hey, we want to uh, uh, say thank you guys for obviously coming because it's always weird when you got to preach all by yourself. And believe it or not, we did that. Actually, Rob was here. Me and Rob. Remember back in the corona days when it first started? That baloney? Whatever. Don't even get started on that. But uh, anyway, good to see you guys and glad to have you here. And of course, uh, by way of just a couple of announcements, what we're going to do is we're going to announce what? Not only a birthday, we're what? Something else to celebrate. Moving. Moving. That's right. We're, and what's the address, Debbie? That's right, 1481 East Lake Mead Parkway. You got it, 1481 East Lake Mead Parkway. Jim was so excited, he was picking up sticks out here. What's that, Jim? 1481 East Lake Mead Parkway. That's right, in Henderson. That's right, so that's what we're doing. And so we want to do that. We also want to uh, uh, celebrate, uh, again, our online viewers. And tonight's uh, no different. We're going to celebrate, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Danelia. From Washington. So she's been tuning in, watching our studies and stuff. So on the count of three, we're going to say howdy ho to, you get to pronounce it as well. One, two, three. Howdy. I just mumble, you get it right every single time. But anyway, uh, we want to do that. And then, of course, what we also want to announce, another good, exciting thing is we are back in action. Our uh, one account on YouTube that's been suspended for three months. Yay, it's finally unsuspended. <laughs> Uh, so we're now firing all pistons, all seven different accounts. So uh, we are looking at, uh, again, if you please uh, stay touched in and connected, subscribe, account, and the new Billy Crone Live broadcast account. And that's right, you can do Twitter, Debbie, don't forget Twitter. And uh, at the Billy Crone account, we live broadcast there as well. So stay plugged in, stay tuned in. We're doing this, obviously, to dance around the issue of uh, being persecuted in the last days. It's almost like Jesus is getting ready to come back, amen? Uh, so we're certainly doing that. Also, if you're missing anything, where do you go? Media.com. That's right. Where's it? Getalifemedia.com. Debbie's favorite website. Getalifemedia.com. So you go there, including some of the brand new studies given up for Lindsay announced on Sunday. Not only the audiobooks coming out in English, she just tackled Spanish. It's just it's wild, man. Spanish. We got Spanish books coming out. So it's just pretty cool. So, and uh, sounds good to me. I don't speak Spanish, but eh, whatever. No, it's uh, been verified. It actually works. I can't believe it. So it's pretty cool. She's cranking them out. So that's kind of a new thing. But where can you get those at? Get a life media. Dot com. So you want to do that uh, and check that out. Uh, but speaking of which, you also can, of course, download the me phone, their phone, uh, whatever phone you got. And uh, just don't try it on your rotary. Okay, if all four of you got that. But anyway, that's right. You can try it. I don't recommend it. But anyway, uh, anyway, man, we got to get cracking. So, but uh, you can do that. Or, and uh, let's work together and learn together, be disciples for Jesus in the last days. Amen. That's what it's all about. Uh, speaking of which, we want to go ahead and uh, take our offering for tonight. And as always, if you're here tonight, if you'd like to partake in that, you can do so. The offering box is at the back of the sanctuary. You can do that as you exit if you feel so led. Also, if you're watching online, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, three different ways. You can go to the website, look at the mailing address, mail it in, the low-tech method, I call it. Uh, but it's still effective. That's right. And uh, But also you can do the website there for click or donate, or you can uh, even have a texting option. Uh, as well. You could text give now as well. So we're going to pray for our study tonight. And uh, then we are going to, we're going to start off by praying with our offering. So let's do so. Father, thank you so much for tonight. Thank you for all the great things we have to celebrate. Thank you for getting to celebrate Debbie's birthday. Thank you for getting to celebrate a, a new chapter in the history of Sunrise Bible Church here in Las Vegas and getting to move. Uh, and we thank you for new ministries, new ways to share your word and the gospel across this planet. Uh, through the audiobooks, and thank you for everyone making all these things possible, working together as your team, God. It's a, a great joy and a treat to see what you're doing. But most importantly, God, we thank you. We celebrate what you've done for us. You saved us through Jesus. And we're not only not going into the seven-year tribulation, seven years of your wrath, we're not going into hell. We get the polar opposite. We're your bride. You love us. You're coming back to get us, and we get to go to heaven, be a part of the millennial kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth, and it's going to be fantastic. 
So we thank you for that tonight. We also thank you in the meantime, before you come and get us, that we had the privilege to serve you and, and to grow in you and to, to share you with others. And we pray that, Lord, that with tonight's offering, that we would do so as you tell us to, not under compulsion, not because we have to, not because we feel guilty, but because we want to. You tell us to give and, and be cheerful givers. Uh, and we pray that you would use this offering, God, that you would be glorified, that we, your church, would be edified, that lost souls would be one for you all around this planet as a direct result of tonight's offering. And we also would pray for our study, God, as we turn again to your word. You, you do not mince. You, it, it's very blunt uh, from you, Old Testament, New Testament, about this thing called witchcraft, the occult. Uh, you, you pull no punches. It's, it's plain as day. You tell us this is serious. And we better not mess with it. Not only us individually, but even a whole country. And God, we're watching even in our country. It's beginning to permeate. So help us to get equipped tonight once again to share your truth, including with those involved in the occult and even witchcraft, so that they can be saved before it's too late and rescued from the darkness that is prevailing. But we know it's not going to last forever, God. We know that you're going to come back and put an end to all this. But Lord, our hearts ache like yours. We want the lost souls to be one. We don't want them to go in the seven-year tribulation, and we certainly don't want them to go to hell. So please bear much fruit with our study tonight. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. Once again, we are in our study, Rural Religions, Colts, and the Occult. Debbie, you're the birthday lady, so it's all on you once again. Number 14 is what? Yeah, give it for Debbie. I didn't even have to coach it. I didn't even do the fake voice. Can you believe that? This is amazing. It must be your birthday or something. That's right. Hey, we've already done by uh, in our study a recap with the definition of witchcraft, i.e. Wicca. Okay, and again, Wicca means witchcraft. Hello. It's just a repackaged thing. We'll see it again tonight. We took a look at the types of witchcraft, the location. Hello, all of the world, the protection. What's, it, uh, what's that? Jesus, always a safe answer. That's how you get protected uh, from that. And then also the history. We've been dealing a lot on their history. First of all, we finally made the journey around the planet, world history. And then we began to take a look at the Wicca history as well. Around the world, just like the Bible said, Wicca is nothing new under the sun. It's been going on ever since the Tower of Babel. And then from Babel, it went to Egypt, then Greece, then the Roman society, Asia, India, the island countries, Africa, Latin America, and Europe. And then last time we saw, okay, uh, in our witchcraft study that uh, it was uh, basically, this is where we get modern witchcraft today. It's been repackaged, it's been relabeled, but it's still old fashioned witchcraft. But a lot of it, not all of it, but a majority of it has come from the European branch of Wicca, uh, from uh, witchcraft in Europe. And so again, okay, so who started this? Who started this repackaging of just flat out witchcraft uh, so that people would just get s seduced into it just because it's been the name's been changed. Well, that's what we've been taking a look with. And last week we saw that started with this lady, Margaret Murray. She was con considered what? Murray was the grandmother, okay, of modern day Wicca, okay? And basically what she, we saw was she was an Egyptologist and what she did and what was Egypt involved in? <laughs> heavy duty witchcraft and then she brought that into europe and she wrote this book the witch cult okay and that really began to make witchcraft popular over there in the uk once again okay and eventually it led to the ban on witchcraft uh being lifted and we'll get to that a little bit tonight then she wasn't just writing a book that made witchcraft popular that started it she also was popular with the british people Right. And people love to interview her, unfortunately, and that helped to begin to spread as well. Well, from her, it spread to this gentleman, Gerald Gardner. Now, if she was the grandmother, what was he? He was the grandfather of modern Wicca or witchcraft. It's the same thing. OK, now he was influenced, of course, by Murray. He got in contact with her. So he started doing it. And uh, but he was also influenced by another gentleman, Alistair Crowley. Remember that? We're going to see that even again tonight. Once again, Crowley, who the secularists, the secularists call the most evilest man that ever lived. OK, is involved in Wicca and its uh, beliefs and underpinnings. OK, but this Gerald Gardner was not only in contact with Murray and Crowley. OK, he wrote the witch's workbook called the Book of Shadows, which is still major, mega popular uh, and considered a, a great resource for amongst witches. Obviously, it's a horrible resource, but amongst witches called the Book of Shadows. OK, and then, of course, his last name is Gardner. So guess what? He developed Gardnerian Wicca. Okay, and again, what we're going to see is we continue to progress as these guys continue to branch out, including in America. 
okay, they're going to, basically it's Wicca, but Wicca is going to spread out in different fingers. There's going to be different branches, right? There's Gardnerian, there's Alexandrian, right? It's all Wicca, but they each get to put their spin on it, okay? And that's why I think a lot of it, we'll get to eventually their practices and their beliefs, Lord willing, but that's why I think a lot of people get seduced into it because it puts you in the driver's seat, right? So here's the big pot called Wicca, but you get to take out of it what you want. Do you want uh, like the, the version that Gardner came up with or Alexander came up with or this person came up with? You get to pick and choose. Now, what does that sound like? New age, right? It's the same thing, right? New age, you get to pick. I'll take a little bit of Hinduism, a little bit of Buddhism. And why does it feel so good to the flesh? Because you're God. You get to de- the lie of Genesis 3. You get to decide between what's right and wrong. That's the same thing that's going on with Wicca, i.e. witchcraft, okay? They split off and then people just pick and choose where they want. And it continues to split today, okay? Some meet individuals, some meet together in covens, but that's kind of what's going on. So he started gardening <clears throat> witchcraft. And then the next one in line led to this lady. This is Doreen Valiente. And she's got the garb, the broom. She's got the whole nine yards, okay? But this lady really began to make witchcraft sound witchy, very poetic-y, even if you will, a little Shakespearean feel to it to make it more palatable for people. And they're even saying that if it weren't for her work, okay, uh, Wicca may never have gotten off the ground, okay? So we're going to take a look at that tonight. But before we do that, once again, let's take a look at yet another passage in the Bible saying don't get involved in witchcraft. Shocker. Isaiah 47 is our opening text. Isaiah 47 is our opening text. We're going to read verses 8 through 14. And of course, this is God's judgment on Babylon. Okay, and we're going to see why God has such strong, harsh words for Babylon and why he did judge Babylon. Okay, we already know in our world history uh, section here, uh, Babylon was steeped in what? Witchcraft. And that's where it all started eventually and then spread across the planet. Okay, agreeing again with the biblical account. But let's take a look at what they were involved in. And man, it's all over the place. You, you, you don't have to read this and find out some secret southern hidden Hebrew. Uh, why, why was God judging this nation? No, it's, it's very plain. Okay, and let's take a look. 47, Isaiah 47, verse 8. Now, then listen, you wanton creature. Now, if God came up to you and called you a wanton creature, how many guys would say right out of the gates you're in trouble? Okay, that's a pretty obvious sign there. You wanton creature, lounging in your security, and listen to what? And saying to yourself, listen, I am, and there is none besides me. So what were these people involved in the occult witchcraft saying? That they're gods, right? Excuse me, there's only one God, right? Also, if you read Isaiah, how many, it's a phrase he uses all, uh, God says to himself, I am God, besides me, there is no other, repeatedly. So, but that's what the audacity these people had that they were saying. And, and that they're also saying, I will never be a widow or suffer loss of children. Both of these, God says, will overtake you in a moment and a single day, loss of children and widowhood. They will come to you in full measure in spite of your many what? Sorceries and all your what? Potent spells. So what are they involved in? Witchcraft, the occult, right? You have trusted in your wickedness and have said, no one sees me as if God's blind. Your wisdom and knowledge, i.e. in the witchcraft and the occult, misled you when you say to yourself again, I am and there is none besides me. Disaster will come upon you and you will not know how to, what's he say? Conjure it away, right? You can't just make it go away by your witchcraft and sorcery, right? And then he goes on and says, a calamity will fall upon you that you cannot what? ward off with a ransom, right? You know, you, there's no amulet that you could use. Do you see what God's doing? He's playing on their own words. None of your witchcraft, none of your sorcery, none of your cold stuff's going to stop my judgment from coming. You ain't going to ward this baby off with a ransom. A catastrophe that you what? Cannot foresee. Again, that's what they also do. Divination, that they know the future. Come to us and whatever. God says, you ain't going to see this one coming, right? And it will suddenly come upon you. Keep on them with your magic spells, with your many sorceries, which you've labored since childhood. Perhaps you will succeed. Perhaps you will cause terror. All the counsel that you've received has only worn you out. Let your what? Astrologers. How many? I can't believe this. Even on social media, it's like, are you crazy even so-called christians hey what's your horoscope my horoscope said this today and they're quoting horoscope the christians are supposed to be christians what 
Astrology, we saw again in our New Age study, folks, that's nothing you want to mess with, okay? It's part of the occult. Uh, let your astrologers come forward, the stargazers who make predictions month by month. You know, the occult, they go by their calendar. We'll get to that eventually. Let them save you from what is coming upon you. Surely they are like stubble. The fire will burn them up. They cannot even save themselves from the power of the flame. Here are no coals to warn anyone. Here is no fire to sit by. Can I translate that for you? You're in a big um trouble with God. Because you got involved with witchcraft, even to the point where you thought it was going to give you security. It gave you so-called God-like powers. Even you had the audacity to say that you are God. And God says, boy, I tell you what, you guys are in trouble now. Because God alone is God. He alone is all-powerful. Only he could provide true safety and security. And he warned about it long ago, but they still went ahead and persist. So guess what? God's patient, but he's pacing up to a point. And so what happened? Bang! Hammer came down. And he took Babylon out. Now, here's my point. Do you think Old Testament, New Testament, God changes his mind on the occult and witchcraft and how he feels about it? Absolutely not. So if God's got strong words for Babylon back then, what do you think he's got for people who get involved into it today? Same thing, including even on a nationwide level. If your nation goes down this route and you keep it up, what's going to happen? God's going to take you out. Right? And that's a, that's a clarion warning call, folks. We need to be prepared for it. Right? So let's get back to see why is even our nation getting so infiltrated with the occult, specifically with witchcraft. Well, believe it or not, again, it, it was this lady. Now, this is Doreen, okay, Valiente, as you can see there. Okay, so we had the grandmother of Wicca, the grandfather of Wicca. What do you think this one is? She's the mother, okay, of Wicca is what she's considered. And this is from their own camp. Okay, the mother Wicca. She met Gardner in 1952, this lady here, uh, Doreen uh, Gardner, 1952. And under her direction, she revised his Book of Shadows. Remember the Book of Shadows, what that was? That was all the spells and things and all the rituals and calendars. So she revised it to make it more, quote, for popular consumption, right? You know us guys, maybe not the most artistic, uh, even myself. Uh, there's many, many people who clean up what I write. And those of you who are involved in that process just laughed. Okay, heartily so. But that's okay. I swallowed my pride a long time ago, right? But, you know, guys, and so the same thing. So he, he whoops out this book of shadows, but it's kind of, uh, and so she basically cleans it up and makes it very poetic -y, dare I say, this is their words, very witchy, witchy sounding. And so what it did is it started to make it more palatable. It's like, oh, oh. And, and, and I'm telling you, it was a huge influence, okay? Now, her so-called experience in the occult began when she was nine years old in what she called a, quote, indescribable mystical experience. <gasps> well, if it's a mystical experience and you had goosebumps, it had to be from God. No, that's what you hear from the charismatic community all the time. Doesn't mean it's from God. And hers certainly was not from God. Uh, on a, a summer evening in, 19, in the 20s, <clears throat> she crept into her South London garden at twilight and, quote, was consumed by the feeling that her surroundings were, quote, very potent. And then, quote, and this is a secular article, says that uh, her parents were right to wonder whether she was interested in the occult when all of a sudden she begins going around the neighborhood and the household on a broomstick. So guess what they do? They're trying to fix her, right? They send her off, quote, to a convent. Oh, yeah. That's like, that's going one fire to the next thing. Uh, Roman Catholicism is not going to fix you. I mean, as I was going through this, I was going, wow, that's so sad, right? Because we dealt with for 12 weeks our Roman Catholicism. Study. It's a works-based false gospel. It's pseudo-Christianity, fake Christianity. She ain't going to be helped by going into a convent. Probably going to make things worse. And apparently it did. She ran away. And I would too, frankly, to be honest with you. Okay. But what's sad, I thought, well, man, what, what would happen if they got her plugged into a good evangelical church that preached the Bible? Maybe her life would have been different. Unfortunately, it wasn't. It wasn't. So they chucked her off to Catholicism. Didn't work. She left school, refused to go back. And then she began to be inspired by the books. Guess where she found these books? Even back then in the library. Good thing we don't deal with that today. Yeah, you're taking out good Christian classics and banning them. But man, you're allowing the occult to infiltrate on a massive scale. And don't think that that doesn't have an effect on kids. Right. Okay. And that's just the library. Who uses the library anymore? The library now is the Internet. And is it everywhere? Yeah, you have conservative Christian biblical ideas that are being blocked, as we saw on Sunday, called hate speech. But boy, you can say anything you want about witchcraft and the occult, it's going nuts. So the new worldwide library is promoting it on a massive scale, even more than her. But the old low-tech method, the library, okay, uh, had a major influence on her. She became fascinated with witchcraft. Decades later, she became, quote, one of the most important prominent figures 
in Wicca. Uh, Wicca at that point began to become, listen, the first fully formed new religion to appear in England and spread across the world. And what it did was two things happened. She did the cleanup basically on gardener stuff. Okay. She began to clean it up and make it more palatable. At the same time, I think it was 1951 that the lift, there was a lift on the ban on witchcraft. Okay. In England. So right when the band gets lifted, she makes it more palatable, and then it begins to go out there on a massive scale, okay? Uh, and that band had been in place for over 200 years. Big mistake, big mistake, okay? Now today, uh, there's an expedition in her hometown in Brighton. Uh, it shows some of her collection. You can see some of that stuff here. Here she is uh, with a ceremonial knife called a thame, or however you pronounce it. Uh, with that, uh, but there's all kinds of things that they house there and it's like it's a tribute like it's a wonderful thing She did for for the UK. Excuse me tarot cards uh, two glass curse bottles and things of that nature uh, She's also got some items from Gerald Gardner uh, As you can see here ivory wand and some things of that nature and it's crazy who would have thought that people would say hey Let's celebrate witchcraft. Let's build a museum. Well, it ain't just there folks. It's even here in the United States Okay, we'll get to that uh, in just a little bit. Okay, but again, Valli Valiente, she first became aware of gardeners. So she goes to the library, right? And she gets influenced with witchcraft after having that experience that was not from God. Okay, but she does eventually, again, get connected with gardener. There's your tie. Okay, but how? She read a magazine. Man, so what, what is, was an earlier promoter of witchcraft and help it to spread? Media. Once again, media. And uh, so she read a magazine about him. So she contacted him. And so next thing you know, she gets in contact with him. This is in the 50s. Okay, after the ban, 1951, the ban was lifted. And then things go well, uh, if you wanted to apparently be a witch, unfortunately. And he made her his high priestess of the coven. Okay, and then eventually she begins to break off. But he encouraged her uh, to help with the rituals and the ceremonies. She does the cleanup thing. And she basically, he promotes her as the face as the face of Wicca. Okay, I don't know if he was concerned about his large beard and pointy hair, as we saw last time, if you recall that picture. Maybe that would deter people, but she looked more like a, a witch. You know, kind of like the movie, or the, the old uh, sitcom, Bewitched, right? They didn't pick some old <laughs> looking lady, right? With all due respect, ladies. They picked somebody that was very attractive and things of that nature, just again, to popularize it even in America. So she, she becomes the face, okay? But uh, listen to what they says. She gave the modern craft religious litany and a logical framework, and this allowed it to be more easily passed on, and quote, is probably the reason it spread so rapidly and continues to spread across the world today, all from her. So that's how, that's how influence it, it was, okay? In fact, they said this, had she not done that, had she not cleaned up Gardner's work, made it more witchy, poetic-y, palatable for people to get sucked into it, right? Okay, um, then quote, Wicca would almost certainly be very different and may not have survived in today's world. So she played a huge role in it, unfortunately, okay, and became a pivotal figure. Now, she wrote a bunch of books herself, eventually, as you can see here, The ABC of Witchcraft, The Rebirth of Witchcraft, Witchcraft of Tomorrow. Uh, they say that um, uh, this one, though, The Charge of the Goddess, was one of her most important ones. Uh, the key word there is goddess, and what she focused on and encouraged was the worship of the female goddess or female deity, uh, which almost all Wiccans still to this day We'll get into the, the female goddess and the male god, the horn god, uh, eventually. But uh, the female began to usurp the male as far as the prominent, quote, deity, right? And then, uh, because they believe that the goddess is the womb from whom all things came, right? And then at the, about the same time that starts getting launched out, uh, guess who starts pulling into this and promoting it as well? Feminism. We're probably in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, if we're still alive and still here, going to have a whole study demonstrating how feminism is all about promoting witchcraft and comes from witchcraft. Okay, ladies are being sucked into women's rights and women's power. Show them what you can do over a man. That's witchcraft. That's the female goddess worship mentality that's involved and embedded in Wicca. Okay, uh, but this was uh, going on and she was a, it just so happens also Doreen, Okay, was a strong supporter of women's rights, wrote about feminism in her books, the witchcraft books, as well as speaking up for feminist issues throughout her life. And quote, such attitudes therefore attracted, guess what? Young women into the particular religion. Religion of what? 
Wicca, okay? And, and why? Because, quote, a witch, they, in Wicca, a witch is the image, the ultimate image of independent female power, right? Don't let a man tell you what to do. And that's the same message that feminism is running on, and it's not by chance. Because that's step one to get you seduced to come their way. They're going to indoctrinate you into witchcraft and the female goddess worship. We'll get into that later. Her final speech uh, was made in 1997. And uh, it was there that she urged the Wiccan community to accept homosexuals. Okay? Because it's basically come one, come all, whatever you want. Uh, and uh, then her health began to deteriorate. First she was diagnosed with diabetes. Then she got terminal pancreatic cancer and she died in 1991. Well... That is what really helped Wicca to begin to spread, period, that revamping, okay? Now, let's see how specifically, okay, it comes to America. Because, you know, by and large, we're still over in the UK, right? Okay, is where it spread. Now we're going to get to this guy, okay? As you can see here, this is Raymond Buckland, okay? As you can see there. And uh, he was uh, basically also contacted, guess who? Gardner, okay, he was also influenced by Murray. So again, you got direct ties of what's going on here. But he was founded uh, what was considered the first Wiccan coven in the United States. Okay, so he brought it over to the U.S. Okay, in fact, uh, we got the grandmother, grandfather, mother, guess what Buckland was? And this is their own terms, not mine. He's the father of modern American Wicca or witchcraft. Okay, it came from this guy. He was a prolific author, uh, bringing witchcraft to the United States. Uh, he was a leading spokesman for Wicca in the United States for more than 50 years. Uh, he promoted this stuff. Uh, he was born in London, 1934. He was the youngest of two sons. His father was of Romanian gypsy heritage, which is probably where he got some of his stuff. But it was in London that he met his wife, Rosemary, and quote, magical working partner. Here they are in their occult practices. Uh, going down deep, folks. This is what really goes on, and that's a very tame picture, believe you me, unfortunately. But by this point, Ray had more than a passing interest in the occult. He began to read a great many of books, uh, and guess what books he read that really influenced him, other than being raised in the Romanian gypsy background stuff. Margaret Murray's The Witch Cult in Western Europe and Jared Gardner's uh, Witchcraft Today. So again, these two influenced him as well. In fact, so much so uh, did he get influenced by Gardner that Gardner and him began to communicate. He communicates with him even after he goes from the UK to the US. He ends up in New York. He moves to Long Island. So he's on the East Coast. Okay. And he still communicates with Gardner. Okay. And basically Gardner uh, uh, basically sets him up to basically be uh, the branch of Wicca in the US. So it is what's going on there. So now they're kind of branching out almost like a franchise, if you will. Okay. So he, he's going down on, on that route on, on a massive scale. And uh, again, they began him and his wife to spread and their, their coven, Wiccan coven there in Long Island, um, began to grow uh, at a steady pace. And then he began to develop, if you will, an Americanized form of Wicca. Now, remember Valiante, Doreen Valiante, she what? She made it more palatable, more witchy sounding, more poetic sounding for people to get involved in, period, right? Well, that's the UK. Americans, we're a little bit more independent. Don't tell me what to do, right? I'll do my way, democratic approach, you know, some things of that nature. So he came up with what's called, uh, I believe it's pronounced Sax, even though it's like CX, uh, CX Wicca. And basically he took Wicca, kind of like what Doreen did, he took Wicca and Americanized it for an American mindset. Okay, let's take a look at that. At first glance, it may seem that a witch is a witch, but the further you go into learning about the craft, the more you realize there are lots of different types of witches. And since Wicca is an ever-changing religion that adapts to the practitioner, it is ever evolving to meld with the needs of its adherents. With so many possibilities, how do you know which type of practice is best for you? Even if you have already chosen your path, it's always a good idea to learn about other possibilities. And if you haven't chosen a type of practice, here is a great list of possibilities to begin thinking about which one is right for you. Sax Wicker Witch Raymond Buckland moved to New York from Britain and brought with him a version of Gardnerian witchcraft. 
his practice adapts Gardnerian practice for an American culture. Within the practice of Sax Wicca, there is an emphasis on herbs and divination. This tradition does not include oaths of secrecy, rigid hierarchical structures, or a book of shadows. There are no degrees, so a democratic approach to coven leadership is established. Self dedication and open mindedness abound within this practice. So again, he Americanized, you know, no oath, no secrecy, no higher, you know, I'll just do it my way. So basically, that's what he came up with. It's called the Sax Wicca, but it's really the Americanized version of Wicca. Uh, so that his book, uh, he wrote a book called The Tree. It became the, quote, guide to Sax Wicca. This was originally published in, uh, published in 74. It was republished in 2005 under that title there, Buckland's Book of Saxon Witchcraft. So basically, if you want to do a Crone translation, uh, Buckland's Book of American Witchcraft. He, he basically Americanized it. He also wrote, now one of the things he got, you don't need to follow the Book of Shadows, right? That was part of that, you know, you don't need all that rigid dogma, blah, blah, blah. Well, he basically wrote his own, <laughs> right? Uh, this is called the Complete Book of Witchcraft that he wrote. They also, in the witch community, call this the Big Blue Book. And again, this is looked upon as, in their world, essential. You know, you might want to, you get, you get to pick and choose whatever you want. That's what sucks people in. It's relativistic, new aging mindset. You get to be God. You'll decide what's true or true or not true, even in witchcraft, right? And uh, you want to use the book Shadows? Great. But if not, hey, get the big blue book, you know, right? Or maybe use both or pick and choose from both, right? But this book, okay, uh, has, quote, influenced and guided countless students, coven initiates, and solitaries around the world. It is one of modern Wicca's most recommended books. It contains step-by-step -step courses in witchcraft, photographs, illustrations, rituals, beliefs, history, lore, instruction and in spell work, divination, herbalism, healing, channeling. What's channeling? You're actually communicating with demons. Hello. Dream work, sabbats, espots, covens, and solitary practice. So again, he basically, oh, you don't have to follow the Book of Shadows. It's America. Do what you want. But hey, I write, I'll write a book for you how to do it. So that's what was going on. Uh, and again, even has a format that you got questions at the end of each lesson. So you can record your spiritual magical training, blah, blah, blah. And they, again, consider this a resource you got to have in your witch library. Now listen to this, quote, never in the history of the craft has a single book educated so much people. So this was a, a, a landmark work, unfortunately, for witchcraft. Now, again, he then uh, uh, sets up a uh, museum called, the, in 1968, the first museum of witchcraft and magic in the United States. He's saying, that's crazy. Well, nothing new under the sun. Gardner had already started doing that in the UK. So again, there's in communication. So guess what he sets up? He sets up. Now, originally, believe it or not, it started in his basement. It was only a private showing. Then it began to grow, and then it began to grow, right? Uh, and now it's a, a museum that has not only gets media attention, but they even did a documentary about it. And so guess what do you think that does? Makes it popular. And people go and see this place. And it's just crazy. It's all dark, evil, occult practices, including the ritual knives, as if that's something cool. That's gross. Folks, we're going to see, and as we've already seen in the history of witchcraft, sometimes those knives are used to what? Kill not just animals, but people. This is sick. But here's the guy visiting uh, Buckland's Museum. I'll just give you a little piece of it. Well, my friends, welcome to the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Well, this is pretty cool. Basically, the basis of this museum was that uh, there was a man named uh, Raymond Buckland who was kind of looking for some sort of spirituality. He found out about uh, witchcraft, the Wiccan, and uh, got the man who named Wiccan. That's actually Raymond right there, Raymond and his wife. And then this is Raymond Buckland's ceremonial robe. Now in this case, you can see um, that is a wine jug that they used for ceremonies. And then here is a silver cuff bracelet. His wand, Buckland's ritual wand used in the Long Island Coven in the 19th century. He made that ceremonial helmet, that high priest ceremonial horned helmet, made in 1970s. And then here's uh, some more of the uh, U.S. initiated or initiation knives over here. Now in this case, it says in the 1970s, a uh, ceremonial magician friend of Buckland's um, said that he was having his life ruined by a demon in his apartment. 
in uh, Manhattan and so he said somehow this demon was released you can see there's a box in there and it says uh, so he asked for Raymond Buckland's help to capture this and it says it took him three days to trap the demon in the box through incantations he, they said he found a grimoire um, that helped them trap him and it says it's not been opened since there you can see a Ouija board and then in this case they have uh, all kinds of tarot cards and zodiac things it says I Ching coins that belong to Aleister Crowley Wow that's what those coins are right there huh huh once again who comes into play even in the American witchcraft Crowley once again a common thread you're also going to see Lord Mulling uh, in Satan as well, but he published his other books. I just give a little. It went on and on, but that you get the idea. It's it's gross. You and I would go celebrate the uh, the history of the Atomic Museum here in Vegas, or go go to the, the Capitol and let's go. Let's, the history of Abraham Lincoln. You know, we were there in filming, Reed and I. But the people are going to the history of witchcraft, like it's something cool, even in America, and that ain't the only one, folks. But that tells you something's turning, the tide's turning in a negative way. He published uh, many other books as well, The Pocket Guide to the Supernatural, Witchcraft, Ancient and Modern, Practical Candle Burning Rituals. In fact, by 1973, listen, he was, er it's one thing, well, he's just got a bunch of books, I ain't going, people were buying them big time. He was earning, by 1973, enough money with his books that he could take over running the museum full time. Making a full time living, just writing books, right? Uh, and until 2010, he published a book almost every year since. His fa uh, health started to fail in 2015, first with pneumonia, then a heart attack. He recovered from that, but then he began to experience more heart and lung problems. And then he finally died in September 2017. Now, he was the male guy who popularized Wicca in the United States. This lady here is the female lady. Okay, this is Sybil Leake. Okay. Sybil Leake, okay, and uh, she wrote a, 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 a book that really catapulted her into, and I'll use this word, she was basically a celebrity witch. Now, I mean that in a two-fold sense, as we're going to see very shortly. She was considered a celebrity, and she shared her craft with celebrities, okay? In fact, her family did even before her over in England. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, so she really begins to spread, right? So basically, again, uh, she started out uh, 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 in the UK. She eventually comes to the United States to LA. So he's in Long Island. She's in LA. So now you're dealing with coast-to-coast -coast influences, male and female, and it starts to spread on a massive scale. Now, part of that was because, again, she starts writing books right and left on astrology, all kinds of other things, including she had a regular column, watch this, in the Ladies' Home Journal. How many ladies in these women's magazines got indoctrinated in witchcraft because she had a regular column there promoting this stuff? I'm sure that doesn't go on today, including feminism and other things that will draw you away from Christianity. So watch out for those ladies' magazines. I'm sure guys' magazines could do it too. Okay, but by 1969, Sybil Leake was called, quote, the world's most famous witch. And part of it was the book I showed you right there, The Diary of a Witch. Okay, really catapulted her in that. Again, she was born in 1923 back in the UK. In the late, uh, in the 50s, when the witch ban got lifted, guess what? She comes out and says, I'm a witch, but not just a witch, because that might still freak people out. The ban just got lifted. So what do you say? I'm a white witch or a good witch. You know, that, that old coloring factor, right? And so all of a sudden, people are kind of intrigued. What? Huh? Somebody's actually going to admit it right off the bat. We just lifted the ban. And, and it's, she's not a bad witch. I mean, didn't you watch The Wizard of Oz? She's one of the good witches out there. So they wanted to see her. And they literally began to flock her. The village she was in there in the UK, massive amount of tourists. Her landlord refused to renew her lease. Okay, so she decided to pack up bags. And so she goes to America to promote her books. And that's basically why she ends up in L.A. Now, in L.A., it's all about Hollywood, the media. And boy, they pick up on her and promote her. Again, media helped to influence that. It still does it today. Nothing new under the sun. This is a radio uh, presenter at the time, Annie England. This was 1964. She was one of the first ones to interview her. And again, she's given like celebrity status. She's made famous a witch, right? And, uh, and listen to this quote, everyone wanted her on their show. 
And she rubbed with celebrities, including people like Gypsy Rose Lee, which uh, that, that sounded familiar. I remember it was uh, some burlesque dancer, I guess was famous back then. But also, quote, Neil Diamond. So again, the music min- industry is involved, in, yeah, and so is Hollywood, and, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but her legacy, quote, this is a secular uh, article, her legacy is best explained by saying that she helped to cause witchcraft to thrive in America and the UK. And she's considered a pioneer of her time and an inspiration to, quote, modern witches. Now, she had, uh, you know, some flair to her, as you can see there. Uh, she kind of did it up. And if you know something on top of her head, that was a crow. She, tra- she had that crow. I, I, for me, I'm going like, what are, you, what are you, a pirate version of the witch, witches? You know, and you, they got a parrot, you got a crow. But she literally walked around with that crow with her all the time. She named him Mr. Hotfoot Jackson. Right? In fact, here she is in an interview with Hotfoot Jackson, just on her shoulder there, and explaining why Halloween is so good for witches. Another reason why we shouldn't be messing with that stuff. So let's take a look at that. Halloween. Well, for most of us, that's an excuse for a party, an excuse to get dressed up and have a good time. The traditional time when spirits walk. But if you believe in witchcraft, then Halloween is one of the most important times of the year. I'm in the heart of the New Forest, a forest that is absolutely steeped in witchcraft. In the forest there are covens of witches in the forest, each of them with 13 witches, and they all take Halloween very seriously indeed. This is the room of one of them, Mrs. Sybil Leek. She's a housewife and mother, she's 41, she's an antique dealer, and a self-confessed white witch. She says that she could do all the frightening things, like sticking pins in effigies and bringing curses down on people's heads. Now, tonight, the witches and the warlocks will be meeting at such a sabbat. What will they be doing and why? Taking part in just one of the four great sabbats uh, which witches have always done for thousands of years. We shall be doing it because Halloween is quite important to us as a religious ceremony. It's the time of the year when the fire of the sun is dwindling and of course it, uh, we don't want this to happen. And it is also the time when we ourselves will be feeling a great need to renew the energy of our occult powers within ourselves to carry us through for the rest of the year. Are there very many witches about? Well, I think you would be very, very surprised if you knew how many initiated witches there are in the whole world. And not only that, there's a very great following in witchcraft. Including, as we'll see in a second, because of her and her family and other witches in the world of celebrities and political people and things of that nature. Um, but uh, anyway, you can start this just kind of, the, I don't know if it's a gimmick or whatever. Uh, I would assume that her dry cleaner was not very pleased. Uh, having to, but anyway, we'll move on. But anyway, Sybil leaks her book, uh, basically, quote, open the occult to the general public. Where are we talking about? United States of America. So you got the Buckland, the male version on the East Coast, and you got the female version leak on the West Coast, just really, and then getting all kinds of media going at it and encouraging it from both ends. Uh, she left many articles, magazine columns, at least 60 books on astrology, numerology, crystals, mediumship, Herbalism, tarot, gypsies, prediction, dreams, ghost tracking. Isn't that a big thing on the media today? Ghost shows, ghost this, whatever. Okay. She traveled the world and, quote, hobnobbed with, quote, many celebrities. Okay. Uh, towards the end of her life, uh, she was bedridden at the time of her passing at 65. She died of cancer in 1982. But let's get back real quick on that celebrity issue. Right. Not only did she hobnob, as I mentioned, one, uh, Neil Diamond, that we're probably familiar with, and the other, Gypsy Rose Lee. Uh, but that's the tip of the iceberg. But she even admits in another interview that this was nothing new under the sun. Her mom, who was also a witch, her whole family basically, they hobnob with all kinds of famous people over in the UK. So apparently it's nothing new under the sun that you get sought out when you get involved in the occult that the celebrities and those in power come and seek you out. But listen to her admit that family practice of influencing celebrities and important people and figures around the world. Watch this. When we come back, uh, I'd like Sybil to really tell us she's a legend in her own life and she has met legendary figures. She's written a book called My Life in Astrology. We'll be back in just a few seconds. (laughs) 
Sybil, I found your book and I've read uh, three of how many books you've written? Um, 39 I've had published. I've written more, but 39 have made 39 it. 39 books. It's an interesting uh, uh, title, My Life in Astrology. I'm purely dedicated to research in astrology. Well, you're I so, love it. You're a prolific writer. Now, you are also a medium. Mm-hmm. And I, can, I have seen film of Sybil Leek taken into a setting where there were supposedly, or many believed to be, other poltergeists or restless ghosts. How did you start in this? Was this part of your whole background? Well, I always accepted that um, reincarnation as a fact. You do believe in that reincarnation? That the spirit is indestructible. And I think to release these troubled spirits is, is, is part of my life. Tell me now, your mother was involved in some area of, of psychic phenomena? Oh, my it? family. Fa my two sons are far better mediums than I am. Who were some of the people that you saw as a child in England or at your home that came to see your mother? Oh, we had the most, I had the most fantastic uh, childhood because we, I was born in England but spent a lot of the time in south of France. And my father was a very scholarly gentleman and people like H.G. Wells would visit us. H.G. Wells. Mm-hmm. Mm and Lawrence of Arabia, and the Sitwells. And I really didn't know anyone when I was a child, unless they were famous. And it became a natural part of your everyday a, life. It became a part of my everyday life. So on a regular, constant, apparently nonstop basis, all her growing up, who's coming to the family of witches for who knows what? Celebrities, famous figures, political figures, and of course she just continues that on when she comes to what? America. And I'm sure that that's not going on today. I'm sure we don't have celebrities involved in witchcraft. Well, folks, sir, I'm going to give you one. You may not know this. Uh, but people that you wouldn't even think of are involved in witchcraft. But nobody ever makes a big deal about it because it, it's been so downplayed in our culture in America. Tom Brady, his wife is a witch. And I think, oh, that's crazy, Pastor Bill. He admitted it. Watch this. You know, I've learned a lot from my wife over the years. She's so about the power of intention, you know, and believing things that are really going to happen. And she always makes a little altar for me at the game because she, she just wills it so much. And uh, so she put together a little altar for me that I could bring with pictures of my kids. And I have these little special stones and healing stones and protection stones. And she has me wear a necklace and take these drops she makes. I say all these mantras. <laughs> And I stopped questioning her a it long works. time ago. I did. I just shut up and listened. And at first I was like, this is kind of crazy. And then about four years ago, we were playing the Seahawks. And she said, you better listen to me. This is your year. But this is all the things you're going to have to do to win. And I did all those things. And my God, you know, it worked. It was pretty good. <laughs> and then in 2015, it was about early January. And she said, you know how much I love you. And I said, yeah. And she said, I just want to let you know, this is not going to be your year. <laughs> and of course we lost. I said, what does 16 look like? <laughs> and she said, 16 is going to be your year. <laughs> so it was early January this year. And I said, babe, I'm asking, do we have a chance? And she said, yeah, but you're going to have to do a lot of work and you're really going to have to listen to me. <laughs> so man, I listened to her. <laughs> Right after the game, she said, see, I did a lot of work. You do your work, I do mine. She said, you're lucky you married a witch. I'm just a good witch. <laughs> you're lucky you married a witch. A good witch. Straight out of his mouth. Now, notice how our society doesn't even shrink back from this anymore. And they laughed, thought it was the funniest thing since sliced bread. That's how far it's advanced in our country. That somebody is admitting that their wife is a witch and he's also involved in those rituals to help him win games and stuff and everybody just laughs. What did God say to Babylon? You think you're so safe and secure? You think you're so cool? Oh, destruction is going to come on you and you won't be able to predict this thing. And you think he's pleased with any of this stuff? It's nuts. And our culture laughs at it like it's funny. Brady said his family uh, has, quote, space for multiple faiths. This is in a New York Times interview in 2015. He said, I think we're into everything. I don't know what I believe. I think there's a belief system. I'm just not sure what it is. Well, apparently it involves witchcraft. 
At least that's what your wife's pushing, and you're going along with her. Now, as we close, I want to show you just another thing. What's, what are we leaving off on? We had the last two were the major influencers to get Wicca witchcraft going throughout America, male and female. And part of the technique was they're hobnobbing, not just with the media, they became popular and through different sources of media, okay? But they literally hobnob and influence those who have influential power, like celebrities and politicians or whatever. Hang with me at the beginning. This may sound crazy, maybe not. But I got a Crone theory I want to share with you. I think that we are seeing a major influx of the occult in the Democrat Party. Right? And I want to, I want to demonstrate that to you tonight as we close. By the way, we might go a little bit over and we're just going to end in prayer. We'll skip the other things, so don't freak out or whatever. Okay, but I, I got to get this in because, again, it's about influencing people in power. Okay, so that they can eventually permeate your country. And I think that's what's happening, right? Uh, and again, I, and the reason why I start off with that is because I've talked to, obviously, and I'm sure you have many people who are Democrats, and people say, well, how could you ever vote Democrat anymore? Look at the Democrat Party. Look at what they stand for. And sometimes they'll justify it by this statement. Well, I'm just trying to hold on the best I can because I get it. Yeah, they're changing. They've changed a lot, especially recently. And they'll make statements like this. It's, it's just, it's not, like the, it's not like it used to be back in my dad's day with the Democrat and the Kennedy, you know, all that stuff. And, 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 and so they'll admit that it's radically changed, but they're still trying to hang on to that stuff. So, but that, my point is, even the Democrats admit that their party has what? Changed and changed radically. And dare I say, even recently, it's changing even on a whole nother scale. Now, why? Well, I think because the Democrat party is involved in the occult. The occult has infiltrated the party, and I want to demonstrate that to you. This is a secular article. It says this, Marianne Williamson, remember her? One of the ladies that ran the Democrat Party for President of the United States, reveals, and this is uh, secular, Marianne Williamson reveals the Democrats are a cult. You say, well, how, how could her running for president realize that the Democrat Party has turned into a cult? Well, how did, they pose the question, how did Marianne Williamson end up on the 2020 debate stage? Now, if you know anything about her, she's what? a new ager involved in the occult. So it's like, how can somebody involved in the occult be running for president of the United States? Well, they say, because the answer is obvious. She's been with the Democrats for a long time who are also involved in the occult. Now, we dealt with some of this back in our new age study, right? Remember, it started with, and this is the article, starting with Hillary Clinton holding seances in the White House. Now, what party is Hillary Clinton from? Democrat Party, okay? And that was overseeing those seances, and this is well documented. We dealt with this in our New Age study. Seances in the White House with Jean Houston, okay? And she was there to try to contact, and supposedly contacted, Eleanor Roosevelt, which she did, and that's a demon, and Gandhi. So this was going on in the White House with Hillary Clinton, Democrat, right? Well, guess who's there with them? Mary Ann Williamson participated with Hillary Clinton's White House seances. So again, that's what they're saying. This is nothing new under the sun. This occult tie in the Democrat Party has been around for a long time. Now it's coming to the surface and it's gaining momentum and it's changing the party. When Hillary Clinton wasn't trying to commune with Eleanor or Gandhi, she appeared to also share this obsession, not just with Marianne Williamson, but John Podesta, her campaign chair. Now we're not even getting into that yet, but there was some weird wacky stuff going on that began to come out with those WikiLeaks with the spirit cooking and all that. Some seriously, I'll use this word, sick, evil, rotten stuff going on. Okay, but who's, who's, the, who's he a part of? The Democrat party as well. And it's been going on for a long time. Now, not just getting into the party, not just influencing the party like a Tom Brady wife scenario, but it's beginning to change the belief system the occult is of the Democrat Party. And this is why I think people are making the statements like, what has happened? They, it's not like my dad's party back in Kennedy days because the occult has taken over. Now listen to the beliefs currently of the Democrat Party. Do you tell me if they haven't changed and have not are leaning towards the occult? Democrats are twice as likely as Republicans to think that astrology is very scientific. Uh, liberals or Democrats are more likely to believe in astrology, period, more than conservatives. Only 48.6% of Democrats were able to correctly answer that the earth revolves around the sun. That's about half. All right. 35% of Democrats believe they experienced the paranormal. 69% of them believe in ghosts. And they say, quote, that's why Marianne Williamson is up there on stage. That's their party now. It isn't just they changed. They changed to align with what? Occult witchcraft beliefs. 
And that's why you can have somebody in Baldwin and Cole actually running for the President of the United States under the banner of the Democrat Party. And then they said at the 2020 debates, the Democrats let the leftist flag fly. Why? Because because they're, quote, coming out of the closet with their new beliefs. And what's their new beliefs? The occult. 70% of Republicans believe in God. Only 45% of Democrats do. 47% of Democrats say religion isn't really important. So what do they believe in? Quote, spirituality, auras, energy forces, karma, battling dark psychic forces, and being attuned to the universe. What's that? That's an occult mindset, right? As well. Then, after Trump's election, tens of thousands of women swarm the streets wearing pink hats to shriek at the sky and repel so-called dark psychic forces. They believe in everything, ghosts, auras, energy forces, but not God. Now, in fact, that's also, they're not just getting overtaken with occult mindsets and beliefs and people and influences, but this is why their parties become, I'll use this word, godless. And they stand against everything that we believe in as not just conservatives, but Christians, because I think they've been overtaken, okay? Now, remember, this is 2012. I don't know if you guys don't have time to show you the video, and I'm already crunched for time, but remember back in 2012, they had the Democrat uh, National Convention, and uh, they had taken out God from their platform and Jerusalem. Remember that? It's like, why of all things would you go through? Why would you take out God? And then they tried to put it back in. And then there's actual video. You can still watch it on the internet of them trying to put it back in. And people were going nuts. Boo, his, ah, they're all mad. At what? Putting God and acknowledging Jerusalem uh, and Israel in your platform. Why would you do that? How did you get so godless? In fact, that was back in 2012. It's still going on today, folks. It's turned not just in cult influences and beliefs. They're getting godless, okay, in the Democrat Party. In, uh, in fact, recently, you know it's recently because they're wearing the masks. Here's them saying the Pledge of Allegiance. Notice what they conveniently leave out. This one, I'll show you the recording on that. Here's the Democrats leading the Pledge of Allegiance in Congress. The chair will lead the House in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hmm. Something was missing there. Oh, 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 you removed all. God. Oh, I, oh, they removed God from the Pledge of Allegiance. Why would you do that? I mean, think about that. It's not even that funny, but why? You have to ask why. Why would a political party specifically be so anti-God? Anything to do with Christianity, the Bible, or because I think they've been infiltrated with the occult mindset, belief system, and frankly, people who are involved in the occult in that party. I really think that's why. Now, let me give you a couple other examples. We dealt with this in our eight-week study, abortion, the mass murder of children. Okay, but every one of those people that were running for president, there was like a record number, 20 or something. Every one of them were not just pro-abortion, but uh, the bulk of them want to murder children even outside the womb if they've been born alive and says, no, we're not even going to give them uh, any help. And that involves Kamala Harris right now running for uh, vice president on the Democrat ticket. That's what, so, so think, what, how did you become, listen, we dealt with this in our abortion study. How did you become the murder the children party? Because that's what they become. If you're going to be a Democrat, you're a pro-abortion, murdering children. How did that happen? Well, I think it's because who you've been hobnobbing with, to use Sybil Leake's word, right, for a long time now, and it's now coming to the surface. In fact, they're going to the other end of the spectrum. We also dealt with this in our abortion study, the mass murder of children. Now they want to murder adults. And their socialism, universal health care, if you cost the system too much money, it's your duty to die. And if you don't want to die, we're going to have death panels, and we're going to make you die. It says right there, that, and that's why I wanted you to see the article. Democrats have become, this is secular, right? And, well, that's a Christian site, life site. Have become the party of abortion and euthanasia. So both ends of the spectrum, they want to kill babies and kill adults. Is it just an ideal? I don't want to stretch this too far, but what also happens in the occult and witchcraft? You want to, you end up in your sacrifices. You kill what? Children and adults. Okay, and then of course you look at their agenda. Basically everything that the party now stands for is completely polar opposite of biblical values and even the constitutional values of our country. You got the Democrats, Joe Biden right now, he wants to kill babies. 
Trump is supporting, uh, uh, you know, uh, let the babies live. They got defunding police. We want to support the police. They want gun control. We want gun rights. Uh, they want riots and violence. We want law and order. They want illegal immigration. We want legal immigration. They want higher taxes. We want tax breaks. We want, uh, they want weak military. We want strong military. They want overregulation. We want small business. They want, let anyone vote. We want voter ID. They want welfare state. We want working class. They want poverty. We want prosperity. They want big government. We want small government. They want suppression. We want free speech. They want liberalism. We want conservatism. They want communism. We want the constitution. They want socialism. We want capitalism. They want defiance. We want patriotism. Every single thing, tit for tat, is exactly polar opposite. Remember back in the day, it used to blend a little? Now again, I'm not, and I'm not giving the, the Republicans a free pass. I'm not into a party issue. I'm just saying something has radically happened to the Democrat party. And I think even go through this research, it's opened my eyes. I think I know why. Because I'm convinced the occult has taken over that party. And I'm going to give you even more proof. Right? Some people are now coming out and saying with this latest presidential election, um, why is it that you only have witches who only pray against and cast curses and hexes? Now, first of all, the thought that witches would be openly out in the United States of America admitting in mass around the United States, we're all gathering together, we're working in our community to not just pray against a president, but a Republican president. Why don't they ever pray against a Democrat person? Right? Think about it. But why is it only the other side? Because I think you're in that Democrat party and you're not going to pray against yourself. Or if, dare I say, hex yourself. But let's take a look at that. This is still going on. It didn't just happen one time with Trump. They literally meet every month and try to hex and curse him underground. In fact, she admits that it's with their help where all these fake news stories come from. Watch this. Melissa Madeira is a self-proclaimed witch, and she's been casting spells for New Yorkers for years. But since the election of President Donald Trump, she says she's been using her magic a little differently. I am very, very pleased with the results we've been getting. She hasn't shared how the witches cast the hex, but she believes the spells are helping to expose injustice in the Trump administration. Every time we've done it, we've seen new information come out about uh, whether he's been engaged in tax fraud or Russian collusion or uh, fraud with the election and stuff like that. Every time we do it, more and more comes to the public eye. So according to the witch, where is some of the impetus coming for all this baloney that just doesn't stop and it gets crazier as it goes? I will say this. I think this also answers for me why not just the last election, but this whole year leading up to this election, it's not just a battle. We use this word, and I think it's right. It's a what? Doesn't it feel like a spiritual battle? This isn't normal politics anymore. Why? Because there's something spiritually going on in this party that I believe has been taken over by the occult. In fact, I think that they're coming out, I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord. A lot of people, they, they would vehemently say, oh, that's just a quinky dink. But a lot of people are starting to wonder with the new logo, that's a little weird. Of all things to choose, why are you choosing that logo? Well, you could just make that up. I don't know. You start to see all their background, the behavior, who's involved in this stuff, their beliefs, and are they sending a message to their supporters? I don't know. But it makes you wonder, right? I can't necessarily prove it. I don't think they'll ever admit it. But man, it makes you wonder. Uh, and I don't think it's far out base, okay? In fact, talking about this, watch this. And this is another article. We're almost done. If you think that's crazy that they've been taken over by the occult mindset, 98% of Americans who support socialism reject the biblical worldview, which tells you it's a godless agenda, but who is it being promoted by? So again, it's not just you're involved in being influenced in the occult. It's not just you're taking on occult ideals, okay? It's not just your party is, has background in occult and occult practices. You might be even thrown at, you're not even working, the witches are working with you and only you, okay? But the uh, latest agendas that we're dealing with that's being promoted by the Democrat party is godless as well. Right? It goes on to say that, again, 98% of Americans who support socialism reject the biblical worldview. And what has the Democrat Party become? The party of socialism. In fact, Biden came out, and it's on tape. He said, if I get elected, I will become the most socialist president in the history of the United States. Right? 
Okay, quote, that's why one guy says the 2020 election is not about personalities, parties, or even politics. It's about an election to determine the dominant view, the worldview of America. And President Trump uh, has accused Joe Biden of being a Trojan horse for socialism. But again, the mindset of socialism, where does it come from? That's a mindset of the occult. And then the Barna, who did this research, he says, when you look at the Democrats, he says, when you look at the Democrats, they're leading the curve in moving towards the perspective of, quote, life is all about me. Now, you've heard me say this multiple times, and after this witchcraft study, if we're still alive and still here, we're going to get to this in massive detail. But what is the number one law of Satanism? Do what you will shall be the whole of the law. And you know where that comes from? Crowley. And the Democrat Party is moving us towards a perspective. It's all about me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. Again, that's another occult thing. And Barna warns this, the remnant of those who hold to a biblical worldview are the linchpin to turn the American culture around. In other words, if we don't speak up, if we don't get engaged in our culture, then this is what's coming to our country. It's not just, listen, socialism that's coming to our country that Trump's been warned about. It's an occult mindset. It's a godless mindset to take over our country. That's why it feels like a spiritual battle because it is one. Let me give you one more uh, or two more quick examples. I want to prove the point. Everything that the Democrat Party is now promoting and is coming straight out of witchcraft, right? Watch this one. What's the big issue that's going on right now with the riots? Racism, right? Well, guess what? Guess who's, who's promoting that? Witchcraft. And again, I, I don't want you to think I'm just whipping this out thin air as a convenient theory. This is what secular folks are saying. Fighting racism in academia with witchcraft. Self-declared witches are uh, well known for their, quote, wokeness. That's another term you hear all the time. And their hexing of enemies, including Brett Kavanaugh uh, and the Confederacy. And remember getting all the rid of the stat, you know, all the lazy stuff that's going on. Witches are the ones that are promoting this via the Democrat Party, because I think there's a direct tie. Now, speaking of statues uh, and tearing down of our statues, uh, I like this version of if somebody were to uh, try to take down the Statue of Liberty, this would be her response. I like this one. It's pretty cool. <laughs> so, uh, you can't watch that one time. You got to watch that a second time. Take them down. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, you can't put up that baloney, okay? Uh, but again, uh, that, that's where they're saying this has come from. But listen, witchcraft in college is not unknown, and quote, self-declared witches are invoking Satan and hexing young conservatives. Again, who are they working against? And this is a direct quote. Magical thinking is a hallmark of leftist thought. You get it? It's not just the party has gone left. It's not just the party is in socialism. It's not just the part, where's this coming from? The occult. And listen, this is, at least this person was honest. This self-declared witch is just honest about that. So the witches admit that's where this is coming from, right? They admit this, it's now determining the direction of the Democrat party. I'll give you one more, we're gonna close. Cause this is the other latest agenda, not just with the racism and the statues and the burning down and all this stuff and the socialism, blah, blah, blah. But what's the other big thing that's going on right now? The BLM. Black Lives Matter movement, okay? And guess what? Guess who is running that movement? Witches. BML leaders practice witchcraft and summon dead spirits. And one guy says uh, he's calling on Christians right now who have allied, uh, allied themselves with the Black Lives Matter movement. You better rethink your decision. Now you think that's a crazy, crazy statement to make. Well, here they are, the leaders of BLM admitting they're summoning spirits of their dead ancestors, they're involved in witchcraft, and that's what's driving that movement. Watch this. Do witches run Black Lives Matter? Um, and maybe I'm sharing too much, but we become very intimate with the spirits that we call on regularly, right? Like each of them seems to have a different presence and personality. You know, I laugh a lot with Waikisha, you know, and I didn't meet her in her body. Right, yeah. I'm her through this work. It's it's a it's a very important practice. Um, hashtags are for us are way more than a hashtag. It is um, literally almost resurrecting a spirit so they can work through us to get the work that we need to get done. 
I started to feel personally connected and responsible and accountable to them, um, both from a deeply political place, but also from a deeply spiritual place. And um, always, you know, in, our, in, in my tradition, you offer things that, that your loved one who passed away would want, you know, um, whether it's like honey or tobacco, or things like that. And that's, it's so important, not just for us, to be in direct relationship to our people who've passed, but also for them to re know they've, we've remembered them. Um, I, I believe so many of them work through us. Black Lives Matter uh, is ran by three witches who are lesbian witches. Alicia Garza, Patrice Colors, and Opa Tometi, she's of Nigerian descent. They are all three are part of the Black Boule Seeker Society. And there are witches, there are warlocks in the entire spiritual dogma or doctrine of Black Lives Matter is from the West African religion called Odu Ifa, capital O-D-U, then spacing capital I-F-A. But over 3,000 different religions in Africa or Akibalon is rooted in witchcraft and divination. And now they've merged with the Democrat Party. And when you take a look at all the other things the Democrat Party has merged with, it's just a natural slide because it's indoctrinated now in the occult. It's crazy. And that's why one guy says this. How can you reconcile this with what the Word of God says? Quote, we have got to evaluate everything through the Word of God as Christians. So let me translate that statement for you. And I'll just be blunt. Now knowing what you know, and you claim to be a Christian, and you continue to vote for the Democrat Party, I don't care who, you're going to stand accountable to God. Because really what you're doing now, they've been infiltrated. They're not like the Democrat Party of old. They've been infiltrated with the occult. And so you're putting a vote to having the occult take over the United States of America. And you think God's going to bless it? Did he bless Babylon when that happened to them? No. So you might want to think twice if that's you. Because you still hear so-called Christian. I'm going to vote Democrat anyway. I'm vote. Wow. Lord willing, next time we're going to take the next guy who took it even further. This is Alex Sanders. And of course, he founded a strain of Wicca called Alexandrian Wicca. Okay. And he was catapulted in flame, uh, fame uh, as a witch uh, because he wrote an autobiography. So he's using books. But guess what? Here's the big breakthrough. It goes to film. So now you're having movies. Okay. It was called The Legend of the Witches. Uh, began to promote that. Also around this time, before this, Hollywood ceased with their Christian influence to determine movies and their ratings and their scripts. Remember back in the day when Hollywood, believe it or not, had to submit to a religious authority all their scripts? This is why you had shows back in the day where people did not kiss longer than four seconds. That's why when they showed a husband and wife bedroom scene, it was two beds. Remember that? Hollywood, I don't, I don't know why that happened. I think it was a spiritual thing, personally. But they stopped doing that, and then it opened the door to start using the movies to now. Not just books, not just magazines, movies to promote witchcraft and the occult and uh, to the point where this guy was called the king of witches but Lord willing we'll get to that next time well hi this is Billy Crone of Get Life Ministries and I hope you were blessed with this study but in closing let me ask you one final question if you were to die today are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell before you answer that let me share a couple of things that the Bible says did you know that the Bible says that God is holy and that we are not and the wages of our sin or unholiness is death. In other words, we deserve to die and go straight to hell and be separated from God for all eternity. This is the great cosmic dilemma. God who is holy and we are not, how can we have a relationship with Him? The two will never mix. Now, to make matters worse, we don't even want to admit this, even though God already knows He's God. And so God out of love gave us something called the Ten Commandments. 
The Ten Commandments were not something to just memorize or stick on your wall or give the appearance of being a religious person. The Ten Commandments were God's divine x-ray, if you will, into our heart and soul to reveal this truth that we need to admit. And that is this, that God is holy and that we are not. We are disqualified for heaven. So let's take a look at that divine x-ray that God's trying to get us to realize. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments, the, the ninth one says, you shall not bear false witness. That's lying. Okay. How many guys have ever told a lie? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, if you didn't raise your hand, you just did. You just told a lie because we've all done that. Well, that makes us a liar. The, another Ten Commandments says that you shall not steal. Don't ever take anything without permission. How many of you guys uh, have ever done that? Well, you guys already said you're a bunch of liars. All of our hands should have went up on that one. And for being honest, God already knows. Folks, we've all taken something. We've stolen something, right? That makes us a thief. Another Ten Commandments says that you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. He's not just holy. Even his name is holy. Hey, folks, let's be honest. If you can believe it, even the name of Jesus Christ uh, has been turned into a common cuss word. Well, the Bible says that's a sin of blasphemy. Now we're a, a blasphemer. The Bible says you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus said, here's his standard. Uh, uh, even if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you committed adultery in your heart. Wow, so now we're an adulterer. The Bible says you shall not murder. And you might think, well, hey, at least I haven't done that one. Really? Again, the Bible says that the sin of hatred, wishing somebody was dead, okay, that, that's the same thing. Uh, it's akin to the sin of murder. It's just you pulled the trigger in your heart, but God sees the heart. Hey, folks, that's just five out of ten. How are you doing? You still think you're going to get to heaven on your own? You still think that you're qualified, that you're holy like God, and you could bridge the gap and have a relationship with Him forever? I don't think so. I mean, what did we just see? You're going to stand before God, and so am I. We all are. And we're going to have to give an account for who we are. Hey, hey, God, let me in. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a liar. I, I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer. I'm an adulterer. I'm a murderer. And the Scripture is very clear, folks. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're in trouble. But folks, here's the good news. The Bible says that if we would just admit that, that's the first step. To admit that God is holy, that I'm not, I'm disqualified for heaven, I need a Savior. If we would admit that and then ask for the Savior to save us. That, that's what God was doing with Jesus. God gave us His Son, Jesus Christ. He took the death penalty in our place so that we could be completely forgiven of everything we've ever done and be made holy through Jesus so that we can now have a relationship with God both here and now and forever in heaven. We can become qualified. You, the, the word that the Bible uses is a word called pardon, that God is willing to pardon us of all of our sins and crimes that we've committed against Him and disqualified us, that disqualified us for heaven, right? And, and we've actually seen this work in real life. Uh, for instance, uh, there's been people who have committed crimes, gone to court, the gavel's been passed, the judges said, hey, listen, we all know you're guilty, uh, you even admit you're guilty, and uh, for your crimes, you're going to not just jail, you're going to uh, await in jail to go to the death penalty. And did you know that there actually is a way that somebody could get off of death row? It's called a pardon. The one in the authority, the governor, can grant what's called a pardon for that person's crimes, and they literally can go free. Not because of something they did, because the deeds are already done, you can't undo it. Not because of they tried to clean up their act while they were stuck in the jail cell, because that doesn't change anything. But simply out of mercy, the person who has the authority can give them a pardon, and they can go free. And did you know, it's actually on historical record, that there have been people who have been granted a pardon from the death penalty, and they've refused to take it. And so, even though the offer was there to be set free, they themselves still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, in a nutshell, that's what God's doing every single day with all of us, this side of heaven. While you still have breath, you still have an opportunity to receive God's pardon. He's willing to forgive you of all your sins if you would just receive His pardon through Jesus Christ. Again, that's what He was doing on the cross. The cross was the death penalty of the day. But since we weren't there, and since we can't earn it, it's a gift from God, you have to receive that by faith. Reach out even today from your own spiritual jail cell, if you will, and say yes to Jesus and God's pardon 
so that you could be set free and go to heaven. The Bible says that if you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the grave, you will be saved. Hey, folks, if that's you, don't delay. You may not even have tomorrow. Today could be your last day. Please accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Confess with your mouth He is Lord. Believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the grave. And the Bible says you will be saved. Well, this has been Billy Crone of Gill Life Ministries. If there's anything that we could do for you, our information and, and number will come up here shortly. And please don't hesitate to contact us. But remember, I hope to see you in heaven. God bless.